Welcome everyone to Aspiring Mentors webinar session. On our today's webinar, we'll be discussing on important uh, tips for the upcoming March, uh, residency March 2023. Our today's presenter is Dr. Matthew Simpson. He is a PGY1 internal medicine resident at uh, Allegheny Health Network. And he's also a CEO of uh, Top MD Tutors. So at Top MD, they provide tutorials for SMLE complex and they also help students with uh, personal statements and um, ERAS application and interview preparation. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Simpson. Thank you so much. I'm trying to share my screen. Cool. Um, yeah, as I was just told, um, my name is Matt, Dr. Simpson, whatever you want to call me. I'm current PGY1 um, resident over at Allegheny General on Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, just a little bit about me, I'm from Ohio. Um, so I'm actually a US IMG, um, but I've worked with plenty non US IMGs. Um, we have several um, at our current residency um, location. Um, so I'll be able to answer a few questions about that as well. But um, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and start. So as we know, um, this is just some residency advice and tips from, from the match, you know, some things that I wish I knew uh, when applying um, and, you know, um, just some like top 10 tips. I think that'll be very beneficial um, for anyone that's applying this year. So without further ado, here we go. Um, so here we have like the, the sort of the um, outline, right? Like these are the deadlines. This is very important. So if you don't have this, please uh, take a screenshot or whatever you need to do. Um, so as we know, um, June 8th is when ERAS um, officially opened up for you guys. Um, so it is officially open. I think the first thing that I would do um, as of right now is definitely get your token. Those tokens, I'm not sure exactly how much they are, um, but you need those tokens. It's essentially like the key to start the car, right? So if, once you get those tokens, you then can open up your ERAS and then you have to link them together. And once you link them together, you are then able to eventually submit your ERAS when it's, when it's necessary. So please go ahead and get those tokens right now. Also, um, you will then now start getting letters of recommendation, asking for those letters. That's very important that you start early. Please do not wait until you know, the end of um, ERAS um, time to start asking for those letters. Try and get those letters right now. Also, it's very important to know that if you've applied previously in previous match, um, you can also get those letters to, to sort of roll over. Um, what I wanna draw your attention to is August 1st. So this supplemental ERAS, this actually started um, last year when I was applying. And so honestly, what it really is, it's a condensed version of your ERAS. It's a summarized condensed version of your ERAS application. Um, so what you'll do is not all the programs actually want to use um, like a require a supplemental ERAS, but some do. And some specialties actually are the ones that require. So I know internal medicine's one since that's what I uh, went into, but I think OB-GYN surgery, uh, and dermatology, I think, are the other ones that apply. So not all of your um, uh, specialties will require this supplemental ERAS. So essentially, what is it? Um, it's going to be, you know, um, like I said, a, a summarized version of your ERAS. So you're going to have like a session where you want to put like your work experience, right? Your, so your medical work experience, was it paid? Was it not paid? Um, you know, volunteer experiences, um, and then research experiences. And what you do is when you put those in, you're gonna to have to go in depth about what exactly did you do uh, for each one of those experiences. Um, so um, I always like to make myself sound like way more important than what it was. Um, so I'm trying to give an example. I think I worked for Red Cross for a little bit, just doing like blood drives. Um, but I put that, you know, as one of the experiences because, you know, it sort of helped me love to get into medicine. So. Um, and just like talking really big about yourself is very important um, for those. As well as uh, another aspect is like region, like where exactly do you wanna apply to? Um, if there is a certain region, please go ahead and uh, let them know that there is a certain region that you would like to apply to. So I'm, like I said, I'm from Ohio. Um, so like the Middle East was like an area that I would really want to apply to. Um, so I sort of designated that area as like a main focus that I wanna apply to. You also can signal um, up to five programs 
as well. Um, and it sort of lets them know that like, hey, I'm really, really interested in, in your program. So um, also on the other end, if you do not signal a program, it will not let you know, like it won't let them know that you did not signal them at all. So it's not like harmful for you, but if you know, you're really interested in a certain program, please go ahead and signal them and let them know that you're interested. Um, I, I will say you should not signal a program that you've already rotated in because they know already about you. So it really would kind of just be a waste. You really want to signal the places um, that you've never been that you were very interested in. So that's sort of what the supplemental ERAS is all about. Um, that's going to be due um, in September 16th. Um, but the most important thing is actually your ERAS. So um, you can actually start submitting it September 7th, as you see here, and you um, have up until September 28th to essentially uh, submit your ERAS. Um, what some people always ask me, like, you know, when is a good time to submit? Do I have to submit September 7th or, you know, uh, do I have time? And so to answer that question is you actually do have time. So you can start submitting the 7th. That doesn't necessarily mean you should submit on the 7th. I know a lot of students and people that I work with, they were, you know, still waiting on their CK results or they're waiting on an LOR to come in or, you know, something, um, or they have like one more rotation that they want to, you know, put onto their um, ERAS uh, once they finish. Um, and so you have up until, I would say for me, the 27th, right, of September to essentially submit. Um, and you can submit anytime from the 7th to the 27th. And when that those program directors, like when they open up your um, ERAS the next day on the 28th, it doesn't show them when you submitted it. So it'll anyone who submits on the 7th and then anyone who submits on the 27th, they will both show that they submitted on time. That's it. Um, now, if you submit after the like on the 28th or afterwards, then it will let them know like, hey, I you know you, this person submitted late, and that's like a penalty. You don't you don't want to do that. It looks poorly um, on your application. Um, so going a little bit more in detail about the ERAS, um, a lot of it is like, you know, putting your scores in there, a lot of your personal information, um, where you did your rotations, grades um, at those rotations. Um, you know, you can put, you have to put your CV in there, your resume. So if you don't have that now, please start working on that. Um, there's some services out there. I know um, at TopMD, we offer some services um, for your, you know, your ERAS or um, for your CV prep. Um, I want to say, what else do you want to do? Yeah. So then also, you know, putting um, like sort of like the supplemental um, ERAS, you're going to put like your work experiences. Was it like paid, not paid? Um, your volunteer time, um, and then like your research as well. So like this is like an extensive list of things that you want to put um, into like your ERAS. And you want to add as much as you can because you want to try and stand out against all the other applicants, right? And when you do submit like that kind of information, please be sure to go into detail about what exactly was your role um, during that work opportunity or that volunteer experience or during that research experience. Um, that's very important. Uh, they like to know exactly what, you know, what exactly did you do? Um, and then, you know, um, that's really it for as far as like the ERAS. If you guys have any questions, we're going to have time at the end to ask more questions. Um, but then, you know, after you really submit um, on the 28th, that's like where the fun begins because now like you start like interviews and I'll go a little bit more in depth about the actual interview process. Um, so first I wanna talk about is your personal statement, right? So I think on the personal statement you have up to like, it's like 2,800 characters. Um, and I think that's, I can't remember how many pages that is, but you do not wanna exhaust that, right? So what you wanna, the goal of your personal statement is to write under one page, right? You have to imagine that a program or director has to go through all like thousands of uh, personal statements. So reading, books and paragraphs of each person is not going to be beneficial. So if you're under a page, uh, that's what they want to see, right? What is your personal statement, right? Your personal statement is really the opportunity for you to present information that cannot be found elsewhere on your application, right? So, you know, maybe some skills that you have or some experiences that you had um, that make you, you know, 
a great applicant or a great candidate for that program is something that's very important. Um, this is a time where you actually specify what specialty you know you want to do. So for me, it was just internal medicine. Everything was about internal medicine. But you can write different personal statements for different specialties. So say you want to apply for internal medicine and you also want to apply for family medicine. Well, you can write a personal statement that's specific for internal medicine. And then you can also write a separate personal statement that is uh, specific for um, family medicine. Um, and you can assign them at the end, like when you're getting ready to submit your application, you can assign them to certain programs. So um, that's something that's very important to know. Um, what, like, you know, some of the things that you want to mention in your personal statement, again, the qualities that sort of um, make you a great applicant or a great candidate for that program. What essentially are you bringing to this program? Why should they select you out of the other thousands of, you know, applicants? You know, that's something that you want to talk about. Also, a unique story, right? It's, it's, it's very important to try and make yourself stand out but also at the same time, you want it to have a theme, right? I always tell um, a lot of my um, clients that there has to be a theme that you have, um, whether it be, you know, through my life experiences, you know, X, Y, and Z, this has made me turn into like a great, you know, physician. This is why I will be a great internal medicine physician or whatever, right? It's very important because after your program director is done reading your or your personal statement, you want them to take something with them. So like, oh, hey, I remember Matt, he's the guy that went through this and this and this, and this is why he's a great applicant. It has to be something. A lot of times people just list random facts off in their personal statement, and there's nothing really to latch on to. So that's very important that you make sure that there is a theme for your personal statement with your unique story added to it. Um, and then Another thing that the personal statement is good for is kind of talking about things that may be red flags that you really can't really discuss through your ERAS. So I know one of the common themes is like extended leave of absences. So, uh, you know, maybe you took a couple extra weeks off or something um, or maybe poor grades. You know, that's another thing that people uh, like to talk about. My advice for that is maybe do a sentence about, so like, let's say, hey, I did not do well on step one, just do one sentence on that, but then do a, the rest of the sentence, sentences should talk about um, why what you've learned from that experience. That's kind of how you want to flip it. So don't focus too much on negativity. You want to focus on what came from that experience or that loss, right? So like, yeah, I messed up on, you know, my step one, but from this, I learned, you know, how to properly study or that, you know, it's okay to reach out for help or um, it made me learn, you know, proper study techniques. So now like for my step two, that's why I did a lot better or, you know, wh what have you, or, you know, a leave of absences, that's also very important. Um, you know, there was a death in the family and this is what happened um, or it's, et cetera, right? So those are the things that you kind of want to address um, during that personal statement. Also, um, I guess this is more for like early on, but you know, you want to start writing down things, or at least if you haven't already, you should be writing down big things that happened in your life. Um, this is important because later on, when you start writing your personal statement or you're talking about these things in your ERAS in a few in several months, you may not remember all the details, right? So, you know, you took a a trip, a medical trip somewhere, and this is your experience with it. Definitely jot that down. Um, so that way you can go back when you're actually ready to write about it in your personal statement or, you know, talk about it in your ERAS application. Um, and it will be a little bit more fresh in your mind since you, since you wrote it down. So please write that information down. It's very important. Um, gathering letters of recommendation. So this is, this is really um, a very important aspect of your um, ERAS. One, um, one fact I will say is please always waive your letter of recommendation. Essentially, it just means that you do not have to see your letter before it's sent out to your, um, the program directors. Why is that important? It just essentially saying like, I trust that everything this person is going to say about me is going to be good, right? If you do not waive, it kind of looks like why didn't you trust that they would say something about, you know, like say good things about you. Um, so always waive uh, your rights to, you know, to essentially um, see that. 
Um, another thing I already mentioned it, like I said, if you've applied in the past um, and you already have those letters, they can carry over. I will say if you do that, reach back out to that attending um, and have them sort of update. You know, if anything else has changed in your life, maybe they can add that to your application. Um, also, you know, when you're asking for letters, you know, give them something to work with, right? So I always let them know like a fun fact about me. I let them know my grades, um, you know, what I like to do as hobbies, my, you know, where am I applying um, and what am I applying for, right? All these things help the writer make your letter more personable. And that's very important because a lot of times you can ask someone for a letter and they would, they have a generic letter that they have already made for any student who asked them, they'll just put your name on it and they'll send it out. And a lot of programs know that, right? So if they have like personal information about you, um, it just makes it look, you know, a lot better. Um, but yeah, and also I'm trying to think, I think you can have a max of four letters of recommendation per like specialty, if I remember correctly. Um, so just keep that in mind. Do not you know, don't go overboard and ask everyone for a letter. You always want to try and get like a program director if you can. Um, those are like, the, you know, obviously those are like the best kind of letters that you can get. And then you also obviously want to get um, them in the specialty of your choice, right? So for me, all of mine were internal medicine. Um, even the program director over internal medicine helped me or helped write a letter for me. So that's, you know, that looks highly upon yourself. If you're one internal medicine and all your letters are ob guide attendings, it's, you know, it's not a, it's not the worst thing, but it doesn't necessarily look good, right? So just keep that in mind. Um, so some of the tips that I kind of want to give you guys, you know, one of the biggest things is applying broadly, right? Um, this is not a time to really save money. I'll be honest, right? I, you, spend, you will spend a lot of money. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's just the name of the game. Um, you do not, you've already spent so much in your education, and your time, you do not want to try and conserve money and not, you know, maybe apply to only like 10 places. And then you just don't get in those 10 places. And now you have to wait a, another year and submit more applications and pay all these token fees and everything all over again. So in the end, it's better just to apply broadly. Um, what else do I want to say? So also submitting on time is very important. Right, so we already talked about the deadline. I can go back up and show you in a little bit, but submitting on time is very important. It lets programs know that you are responsible and you're serious about, you know, um, you are a serious person and you're and you're very responsible. And that's that's kind of what's just simple. Um, and then also being honest on your application, right? That's very important. I know, you know, you want to always make yourself sound better, you know, with your words, but never lie on your application because you will get asked all these questions about your application. And if you lie, then it just looks poorly on you. Um, also, you know, mentioning as many awards and as many accomplishments um, as you have received in your application, that's very important. And then also when you do, make sure you go into detail. Like I said, um, it's very important to know like, hey, I graduated top of my class in X, Y, and Z. You know, these things are very important and, and go into detail like, hey, I you know, studied a lot of hours or, you know, whatever. Um, it's 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 very important. It helps make you stand out, you know, uh, when you go into detail about those things. Um, and, you know, even every little award is also very important, as long as it's like, you know, medical. Um, please always mention those. Like I said, it's all about trying to stand out and, and uh, making your application look a little bit more unique. And um, then lastly, I'll talk about. Um, for the advice um, is like your photo. Um, this was, for some reason, it's, it's hard for some people, I'm not sure. Um, but there's like, at least where I'm from, there's like a lot of professional photographers. So it was kind of easy to get like a nice headshot. Um, so um, you can just go online and find like a nice headshot or, or like someone who does headshots and uh, get one of those. I think the problem with the photos is like, ERAS wants certain dimensions. I can't remember the dimensions. You can go online and they'll tell you. And I think that may be the problem. So sometimes people don't know what dimensions they need. So the photographer can't really help out. Um, I want to say there's a website online um, that I don't know if it's an app or what, but it'll let you know, like you can submit your 
picture and it'll tell you uh and you just tell it like what dimensions you need and it'll like reconfigurate your picture so it has those dimensions and send it back to you i'll be honest i don't know exactly the name of the application but i've been hearing about it more and more recently um so i someone said it's on reddit if i remember correctly so just you know check it out um because that may be very beneficial and, and save you a lot of a lot of uh, trouble um so here we have sort of the positions offered um, so like I said, for myself, internal medicine is like, it's very broad, right? Like a lot of people apply for that, but you can see how many like spots go unfilled, right? And if you do not fill a spot, that's when they start going into SOAP. I'm not very familiar with SOAP, but I know it, um, they like will offer spots and then all the spots that are not filled, it, they fill over into SOAP and then you can reapply and they'll start doing more interviews, like a second round of interviews and help fill in those spots. Um, so you can see, like for internal medicine, there was 9,000 positions offered um, this year and maybe like 3,000 or let's say close to 5,000 got filled. So there were over like 4,000 spots that didn't go filled um, and they had to go into SOAP. So, you know, things like that. So if you do not get in the first time, please continue to apply, um, especially for soap, because you can definitely go in that way as well. So do not get disheartened if you do not go in the first time. And then also we'll talk about grades, because I mean, grades are grades are very important um, for your for your ERAS. So just knowing, you know, what you're sort of what you're applying for, just being realistic. Um, so, you know, my as myself, like I knew I wouldn't get into like neurosurgery. Um, so I got two fifties on my step two, um, which I mean is good, but I knew it wasn't like neurosurgery good as an, as an IMG. Um, so, you know, I was just like, I'm not going to apply that. Um, but you can sort of see, um, based on your grades, sort of who goes match and, and who goes unmatched based on if you're a U.S. IMG or a non-U.S. IMG. Uh, so you can kind of just keep this in mind. That's very important. And this is based on your step two score. Um, and this one is your step one score. So I don't want to spend too much time on this one just because I think now everything's pass or fail for step one. So it's not like as important. Um, but still, uh, I'm not sure if you have the option of actually letting the, the program director know your score that I, that was like in talks um, in the past. Um, so like, yeah, you have, you know, you pass, but you may be able to like send personally your score to that program to let you know, especially if you did well, and it'll kind of make you help stand up, like help make you stand out a little bit more. Um, so just keep that in mind if you, you know, really do well in your step one. So scheduling and, res and responding to interview um, invites. Um, so one of the biggest things I will say about this is please make sure you have some type of technology that allows you to respond quickly to emails and invites. Um, I've even heard of having a separate uh, email account for you know, specific um, interview invites. Why is this important? Well, when, whenever a program offers you an interview, they're offering everyone else in that cohort an interview at the same time. And so you, it's basically first come, first serve um, for spots. And so if you get the offer at 6 p.m. and you're at the gym or you're doing whatever and you don't respond until 10 p.m., all those spots can possibly be taken, right? And you do not want to be in that position. Um, I'll be honest. I'm trying to think. Guys, I've, I had um, a notification on my phone every time I got an email. Um, and I think one time I was like five minutes late and I still almost missed it. Almost. Like I still got a couple. I had, there was a couple spots left. Um, but yeah, like it, it goes quickly. So please be sure that you have your notifications on and you're always aware of your, um, of like when you get those messages. Um, also like having like a calendar already set out. Um, so that way, you know, um, what days you're available, what day, what, and what times you're available. Um, and then, you know, just as far as like the interview itself, um, I would not schedule more than one in a day. Um, I know some people who will schedule in the morning because a lot of these interviews are maybe like just a few hours. So like they'll schedule a morning interview at one place and then they'll schedule an afternoon interview at another place. This is obviously when it's virtual. Um, 
I kind of would say do not do that because these take these interviews do take a lot out of you and you kind of want to take time for yourself. Um, you also want to take time to research that program as well. So it may be a little bit more difficult if you are focused on one uh, interview and then, you know, you have like maybe only a few minutes or a couple hours to research the next in interview and then or program and then get into that. So I definitely just do one at a time. That's just my recommendation, but you can do as you please. Um, now, if I'm not sure exactly how they're going to do things virtually or if they're going to do things in person, my guess would still be more virtual. I think a lot of programs like that, they can get more applicants that way. And then also it saves them a lot of time and also saves us a lot of money, which is very important. You can apply more broadly that way. You don't have to worry about the travel expenses. Um, so if it is in person, try and be smart about it, right? If you are, you know, you have a, a interview and in, like on the East Coast, for example, please try and schedule all your other East Coast interviews in this, like around the same area around the same time. So that way you do not have to keep going back and forth. And same thing with the West Coast or whatever. Um, those are just some tips that I would, I think are very important. I didn't have to worry about that. Like I said, everything was uh, virtual during last year. Um, so I just needed good Wi Fi. Um, so, oh, that's actually another point. Please make sure your Wi-Fi is good. Uh, I don't know where you have to go. Um, I think there's actually certain locations that they offer you like a room um, with good Wi-Fi for, you know, like business um, interviews, virtual. Um, so you may have that around your area. So definitely check that out. I know some libraries offer that. Um, and then also invest in like a good computer. That's also very important. I just got this MacBook last year. I had like some Dell that was... 10 years old and you couldn't see through it. Um, but for the interview process, I got this MacBook and I think it helped me out a lot. Um, so just keeping that in mind as well. Also, um, accepting all interview invites, invitations, it's very important. What I would do is early on, I'd rather accept all of them and then cancel later on uh, if I have too many versus not accepting them and then with anticipation of getting more and then you, those never come and then now you just lessen your chances of matching. Um, but I will also say this, when you, when you plan on canceling, please cancel well in advance so that program can then have time to offer another uh, student a spot. Uh, it, you do not wanna cancel the day before, it just looks poorly on you. Um, but I will say, please accept all interviews. Um, and then plan accordingly. Um, as far as, you know, the ones that you do want, like the programs that like are your top 10, you want to try and schedule those in the middle. Um, you don't want to do them too early because you're still nervous. You don't really know how interviews work. Um, you don't know the kind of questions they're going to ask, right? So you don't want to do too early, but also at the same time, you don't want to do it too late. Right. Um, a lot of programs will just schedule until they have met the quota. Like they they already know who they want, so they'll stop right then and there. It doesn't they don't have to wait all the way till February. They can stop in December if you, if you will. So you don't want to wait too late as well. Um, so I would say work in the middle. Right, that's very important. I think this is like November December time is like a good time to schedule like the most important um, programs, um, and then. Um, I want to say, you know, they will come like each, I want to say like each day you'll get like a possibly like a new interview. So just keeping that in mind with, you know, like, Hey, I scheduled ours for Friday. So I only have Thursday open. Um, so, you know, when you get a new interview, like, you know, Thursday is probably the only day you can do that. So just like I said, keep that in mind. Um, let's see. Interview tips. Uh, best piece of advice for that is research your program, please. I want you to know everything about your program whenever you have that interview. Um, and also have questions ready for them. It's kind of weird whenever they're just kind of asking you questions and then they run out of questions and then you're just sitting there and you have nothing to talk about. Um, research that person. A lot of times, a lot of programs, when they do offer you an interview, they will also let you know who's going to interview you as well. So what I did was I would look up that person specifically and, and I saw their interests, everything they like, their um, research, right? Just talking points, really. Uh, I'm not saying stalk them, but, you know, keeping that in mind, I, I want to say one of my um, program directors that I work with now, like he's like, he loves shoes. So I'm not really in the shoes, but 
I was into shoes that day, right? So I knew all about the new shoes that were coming out and everything. It's just talking points. And I think that's very important. Um, and then also like, you know, if you, I don't, some pro, like some schools, uh, some medical schools will offer um, interview like um, prep. So like you can practices. So like you can go in and they'll have like a scheduled interview for you, like a mock trial, if you will. Um, so definitely take advantage of those. Um, it, it helps, honestly. Um, and then already have like responses prepared, especially if you know they may ask about, let's say you didn't have the best grades or something happened, have responses ready for those, right? So that way you're not kind of stuck um, trying to answer those, right? Um, and also know your application very well. So if you've done research, right, please know everything about that research because the, te- the, the people will ask. They'll ask like, what exactly this is this? What did you do? Please explain it to me. And I remember for myself, I think my, I had a couple publications and they were like, what was it like four years old at the time. Um, so I had to go back and like relearn everything that I did. Um, and it helped because one of the interviews, the guy asked me like, Hey, what, you know, what is this? And then I had to like go in depth about it and, and he was interested in the same thing. So, and again, like I said, it's just another talking point. Um, and then, you know, what kind of questions did they ask? I know that's like a very big thing. Um, first off, there is, I think match a resident. They, that's what I use at least like to find the like the programs that I wanted to match to or like that offered like to IMG specifically based on like your grade profile. Um, they will sometimes will list some questions on there that that program asks. So like if someone interviewed there, they'll go back on match res and say like, oh, they asked me X, Y, and Z. So, you know, going back and looking at that's very important. I think online, even like Reddit or something, they, will, they can let you know the type of questions they got asked at whatever program. And having, again, like I said, responses ready. For the most part, the number one question asked is tell me about yourself. So please like have a response ready for that. Um, and it's like a condensed version of your application ready, really. Um, for me, I, I always had a philosophy when they asked me about myself, I would do like a, a past a present and a future thing. So like, you know, in my past, I went to X, Y, and Z and I did this. And then presently I tutor, I run my own company. And then in the future, hey, I, you know, uh, I'll be, I'm interested in like pulmonary critical care fellowship, right? So I did a present, past and future thing. Um, I think that was like the best way to answer the question because you're always going to get asked that. Um, but other things, I didn't really get any medical questions. I'm not sure. I interviewed at a lot of places and I, I think maybe only one medical question in it. And it wasn't even a really a medical question. It was more just like, what would you do if this happened? And like, more like, would you get help or like, you know, um, how would you ask for help or whatever? So, um, you know, yeah, you don't really get too many medical questions at least from my experience. Um, but some other things that you can get asked are, I'm trying to think, um, you know, so the, obviously to tell me about yourself, um, hobbies, um, what you would do in certain situations, like, you know, if you're alone and this happens or um, you see someone doing something bad, what would you do, All right? It's more of an, honestly, it's more of an opportunity for the program to get to know you outside your, outside your application. So you look good on paper, but you know, can they work with you for how, like for internal medicine is three years. So like, can they see themselves working with you for three years? So if you get an interview, it means you can actually work there on paper, but now this is a personality check, right? Um, so just keeping that in mind and just, you know, be relaxed about it. Don't be uptight. Um, it's, you know, have fun with the, with the interview. Um, so Lastly, I'd like to tell you that, um, you know, aspiring mentors, you know, they offer mentoring services, which is very, very important. You know, for myself specifically, I had, a, I took on a lot of, I took on a few mentors because I was the first physician in my family. So I didn't really have anyone to tell me like, hey, do this or don't do this. Um, so I wish, you know, like having a mentor was very important for me. So the fact that aspiring mentors is offering that service for free, uh, please take that opportunity um, you're going to meet other, you know, mentors and they're going to be able to give you advice um, on, you know, what to do, what not to do and how to, you know, beef up your application and everything. So please take that. Um, and then as far as like our services, our top MD, 
um, services. You know, I talked about how important the personal statement is. So we definitely review that for you. We can give you some tips. Uh, we can help you edit it as well. Um, and then as like, you know, even your, your ERAS, we can take a look at that um, and give you some tips on that. You know, how to, if there's something that looks poorly on your application, whether it be grades, we can figure out how to, how to go um, around that or how to talk around that, give you some talking points. Um, we can give you some residency advice, you know, a little bit more in depth um, personally for yourself. And then, you know, we even tutor. I think that's very important. Like I said, grades are very important. And so we tutor for step one, step two, um, and step three as well. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, please feel free um, to reach out. Um, that's all I have for you guys. Um, do you guys have any questions um, for me? Thank you, Matt. It was a very informative session. So uh, the floor is open for questions. Anyone is welcome to write it on the chat and then we can begin our Q&A session. So I have a couple of questions which were forwarded to, uh, from other IMGs. So the first one is, uh, uh, what, what, what's your take on taking step three prior to applying for residency? Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, let me say this, I graduated like October. So like mid like interview season, um, then, you know, you have match in, uh, in March and I didn't take step three until like two months ago, um, which I guess is still early. Um, what, with talking with program directors, um, they have said, it looks good on your application, right? Uh, if you've already passed step three, because essentially you're already saying you're going to get your license. All you have to do is just complete the residency course. Um, and it will look more favorable for you in your application if you say, hey, I've already taken step three and passed. So that's very important. But also at the same time, do not stress it too much where you know you feel like you have to take step three because intern year is all about getting the necessary uh, information um, and um, clues and how to pass step three. So it's not it's not in, like if you don't take step three before it's you know it's going to look poorly. But if you do, it definitely looks uh, you know more favorable for your application. So I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. It did answer it. So uh, we have another question. So uh, what was the biggest problem you faced during your application or interview process? And how did you find a solution for that? Oh, man, honestly, the whole application process was hard, like I said, because I didn't have anyone who's taken it be like who's, who's a physician. So like, it was all just trying to like trial and error, trying to figure out what I needed, the timeline, um yeah just like having advice I guess I didn't really have much so I think that probably was like the biggest struggle for me um but you know you work your way around it you know you have your your colleagues who are also applying to um you can reach out to people who worked in your medical school uh who are you know have already matched I think that's something that I did I had a couple of friends who matched last year um, so I would reach out to them and, you know, what did they do on their application? What, you know, X, Y, and Z, I think um, those are the things that really helped me. Honestly, asking for help really like probably is the best thing that you can do. Try you medicine. You do not do anything alone in medicine, right? Um, that's why they have specialties, right? If you do not know something, please ask um, a colleague or, you know, ask the mentors or you guys can, I'll even put down my information. You guys can definitely shoot me an email um and i'll be able to help you as well so always ask uh if you like when in doubt essentially okay awesome thank you so much um so the next question is uh, what's your take on the role of publications especially for internal medicine yeah so you know publications always help right i mean it's never a bad thing to get publications um i had two case reports um and a poster presentation uh for like when I was applying and that's like, that was like huge for a lot of the programs, you know, they love talking about your, your research um, and your publications. That's something that is always highly favored. 
Um, but also at the same time, if you do not have publications, like do not feel like you can't get into a, a good residency program, but you know, anything helps, right? So even if you're, you know, like a poster presentation at like um, the um, American College of Physicians um, sessions that they have like yearly, I think that is, you know, that's something to talk about. And that's something that you definitely should put uh, in your resume. So, you know, publications definitely help. Um, and if that's something you guys are interested in, please like reach out. If you're working currently at like a hospital, they, uh, if they don't have a research facility there, um, talk to the residents, you know, that's very important. They'll, they're always working on like QI projects or, um, case reports that they, you know, just, you know, just started to work on. Um, so like try and get involved, talk to people, see what they know. Um, yeah, because those are definitely, those look very good. Okay, um, so the next question we have is what activities or what are the things that could make an applicant stand out out of the crowd? Um, so, you know, obviously besides like the typical grade, your grades, uh, where you, you know, graduated from, your personal statement, um, I think those are some of the big things that will help you stand out, but it's really just what you write in your personal statement. I think for me, I felt like the personal statement was not something that could get you into a program, but let's say your application looked identical to another person's, they would probably then look at your personal statement and see, you know, which one they wanted to choose based on that. So does, if that makes sense, like that's sort of how your, you know, the importance of your personal statement, it's not necessarily going to get you into a program. They're going to read it like, Hey, I need this person. Um, but if, like I said, they're stuck between two people and that's, they're looking for other reasons to, you know, pick one over the other, they'll look at like your personal statement. Um, you know, volunteering is also very important. A lot of programs love when you volunteer, um, work experience in the medical field is also very important, whether you scribe, um, or had some internships, right. in in the hospital, um, offsite rotations, um, in the, I mean, rotations in the U S um, is also very important. Um, if you have connections to that program, that's also very important. I know a lot of um, residents now, like they were like married to someone in, that worked at that program. So like, you know, that, you know, anything you can get to help you like get a, a one up on someone is, you know, very important. Um, but yeah, I would say that those are like pretty much the important things. Um, and also, I mean, we talked about publications as well. Um, and then research, you know, so I think those things are probably the most important for your application. Okay. Um, so what would you advise for applicants who are pursuing uh, more than one uh, speciality? Yeah, so, you know, your fourth year is gonna be super important because you're gonna do most of your, you know, electives in one or the other place. Um, and when you're doing those electives, be sure to talk to the residents that you're, you know, that you're working with and get some advice from them um, and because you're eventually going to need letters of recommendation. I think that's probably the best thing I could say do during your fourth year, get those letter of recommendations, uh, early. Um, if you're going into different, you know, two different specialties, try and have at least two for each specialty. So if you only have four, try and get two from family and two from internal medicine. Um, when you're writing your personal statement, like I said, write one specifically for, you know, internal medicine, write the other one for family medicine. Um, and, you know, even said, maybe think of something actually, even when you're, you know, writing your personal statement, you can tailor it to that specific program. If there's like a certain program that you want to do, like for mine, like mine was Allegheny, like that was my number one. And so I actually wrote a personal statement specifically for Allegheny. Like, Hey, I've always wanted to come here. I love the area it's close to home and you know I love what you're about and everything so like that's something that I you can tailor your actual personal statement to that program uh, and then you can have some other personal statements you know like general personal statements for whatever um, but you know keeping that in mind is so that's you know that's something to keep in mind I would say okay um, so thank you so much I think that's pretty much it these are the questions that we have um, so before we wrap up, if there's anything else you want to add. Um, yeah, I mean, so yeah, definitely just, you know, with, at top MD, we offer so many resources for a lot of the students. Um, and, you know, we're now uh, pairing up with aspiring mentors and, 
you know, definitely reach out and utilize our resources. You know, we offer tutoring services, OET prep, um, mentorship, right? Um, if you need residency advice or, you know, personal statement reviews or um, ERAS application reviews, you know, all these things are very important to get you into a residency. Um, so please, if we're offering the service, please feel free to reach out to, uh, you know, both of us. Uh, and let us know if you need anything. Um, and like I said, ask for help. That's like probably the biggest piece of advice I can uh, give you guys. If you guys have questions, please reach out to people who know the answer. Um, other than that, that's really that's really it. If you guys, like I said, if you guys have any questions, I can put in, in the chat my, my email. Um, and then if you guys have any further questions from there, I can uh, answer them. Give me one second. I have like so many different emails. I want to make sure I give you the right email. Um, that would be great. Yeah. Let me see. Yeah. There you go. So yeah, so uh, if you guys have any questions, please shoot me an email. I normally respond. Um, I'm like I said, I'm, during, I'm in residency right now. So uh, I'm always on call. The interns are always on call. So uh, during the day, I may not be the quickest to respond. But you know, when I get home after seven, I'll definitely be able to, um, to respond to you guys. Um, so just please keep that in mind. Um, so don't feel like I'm ignoring you <laughs> if that's if that's a, a thing. Um, but yeah, also, if you guys have questions about residency, how it works, um, you know, what it's like to be a resident, um, you know, definitely feel free to reach out, you know, making those connections. Like I said, I, you know, I work with a lot of uh, IMGs. I'm an IMG, um, you know, whether it be non-US or US IMGs, it's, it's very important. Please reach out to us so we can make those connections. Um, anything to help you guys get into residency, that's, you know, that's our goal. Um, so we want more IMGs in the, in the U.S. Um, working in the hospital. So um, please reach out, um, establish a connection with us um, and feel free to, you know, talk to us anytime. So um, best of luck and um, have fun. <laughs> Just have fun with the experience. Yeah, it's the best time because then once you start intern year, it's, it's back to working every day and then you're just tired. So have fun right now. I know it's stressful, but you'll be all right. So thank you so much, everyone, for attending. So we'll be having a series of webinars. Thank you so much.